God is sometimes very silent, and it's difficult for us to accept it, especially when we are hurting. I think that's the most painful time. If you're physically hurting and nothing's going on, it's very, very discouraging. Obey God and leave all the consequences to Him. You fight your battles on your knees. We reap what we sow, more than we sow, and later than we sow. We stand tallest and strongest on our knees. If necessary, God will move heaven and earth to show us His will. Have you ever felt like God was giving you the silent treatment? I mean, you prayed and asked Him to give you direction for your life, didn't hear a thing. Maybe you are going through some physical illness and sickness and you are asking God to heal you, and somehow His ears are deaf. Nothing's happening. You see your kids heading in the wrong direction. You're praying for God to speak to their heart. You don't sense anything's going on. You just feel like God's giving you the silent treatment, that He's out yonder somewhere, over here, but somewhere along the way, you've missed Him. How do you respond when you have those feelings? Do you really believe that God is just is not interested? Do you think that somehow He's really distant from you? Is it that you're just feeling these things, or is it that God really and truly doesn't care? But, but in your mind, in your heart, in your emotions, you believe, you feel somehow God is giving you the silent treatment when you really and truly need Him. Well, God is sometimes very silent. And it's difficult for us to accept it, especially when we are hurting. I think that's the most painful time if you're physically hurting and nothing's going on, it's very, very discouraging. Well, does He have a purpose for it? Yes, He does. Is there a certain way you and I ought to respond? There is a better way. And so, how do you respond? Do you take advantage of it? Do you learn something from it? Or you just let it go by and say, well, you know, I went through one of these circumstances and God didn't answer my prayer. He just ignored me. Well, I want you to turn, if you will, to the 11th chapter of John. And I want us to read these first 15 verses, and it's a passage that most of you would be familiar with. So let's begin in verse 1. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. It was uh, the Mary who anointed the Lord with the ointment and wiped His feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So the sisters sent word to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. But when Jesus heard this, He said, this sickness is not uh, to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister Mary and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he then stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? So they expected him to get killed on this occasion. Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, but he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light's not in him. This he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go so that I may awaken him out of the sleep. The disciples then said to him, Lord, if he's just fallen asleep, he'll recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he was speaking of literal sleep. So Jesus then said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Here's a good example. Somebody Jesus loved. And they knew that he was a dear friend of theirs because it was his house that he would go to often and just sort of relax. And they sent word to Jesus, and they thought he would be there instantly because uh, he loved him. And yet what we see here is that Jesus doesn't do anything. He just stays two days longer. Now, if somebody did that to you and me, we'd think, well, you know what? I thought they loved me. We just, we, we, we'd have a real problem because we felt like that they... They acted one way, and yet on the other hand, uh, they felt some other way. Well, it's certain that Jesus does speak today. In the Old Testament, He spoke to people. He was not silent oftentimes, most of the time. And so God is still speaking. And uh, the issue is, what's, what's this God is silent all about? Well, 
Sometimes God is silent, and more than likely all of us have experienced that in our life. When we've prayed and we've asked Him for something and nothing happened, and we kept on praying and nothing happened. Sometimes we said it was maybe a time of sickness or loss, and you're trying to find the will of God, and Lord, I want to do whatever you say. Why don't you tell me? Let's get with the plan. And somehow, you know what? He's not disturbed by that. Have you ever been angry with God? A few of you say you have. The rest of you know you have. So, uh, you know, at, <laughs> at some point or the other, you said maybe you weren't angry, but you were a little discomforted by things when you really wanted to do His will and He didn't show you what was going on in your life. So, um, what we have to ask is in those kind of situations, God, what are you up to? But you know, if you, you can go from the Old Testament to the New Testament, and um, even in the book of the Revelation, um, listen to what the Scripture says during the tribulation period. When the Lamb broke the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for a half an hour. Now, somebody says, Well, you know, I want to know about God speaking to me, not being quiet to me. But there's a whole aspect of God's silence that is very, very good. And what causes us to be perturbed sometime and impatient and wonder why and question a lot of things about God, I want you to see that His silence is very, very good. And yet, if the only thing I care about God is getting my information and my desires and my request answered, then I'm going to miss some of the greatest blessings I can have in the light of God's will and purpose and plan for our life. So let's, let's just think about it for a moment, and let's talk about uh, the reasons that, that he's silent. Now, um, we might have a right to question, well, why would God be silent when he promises that he loves us, he promises to meet our need, he promises to answer our prayer, he promises to give us guidance, and here he is being very silent, not speaking to us at all. So how does all of that fit? into what God is up to in our life, because we have a right to answer the, ask that question. And uh, so, uh, uh, let's just think about it for a moment. Now, he's not silent all the time, as we said. And sometimes, let's get this straight, sometimes the reason he appears silent is because we're so caught up in the world and what the world is doing and where our interests lie, uh, we, 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 could, we couldn't hear him anyway. Sometimes we just tune him out. We don't have any time for him. We shut him out. We don't think about it. That's exactly what we do. So let's think about some very specific reasons. And one of the reasons he's silenced to get our attention. Sometimes when we're just going along and doing our thing, and then we hop down and pray and ask him about this, that, and the other, and so he's just silent. Why? He wants to get our attention. God, listen, God is not a God on demand that he just comes when I demand that he comes and he shows up and speaks when I want him to. God is the sovereign of this universe and he's the one who is, who is in charge. We're not in charge. He is. And so sometimes he has to work in our life to get our attention. And one of the ways he does that is he's absolutely silent. We don't hear anything. Then, of course, there's unconfessed sin. When there's unconfessed sin in a person's life, you're not going to hear anything. Now, unless, listen, that is, you're not going to hear anything about other things. But if you start, if you're willing to deal with your sin, then he's ready to talk to you about that. But God isn't interested in all this other stuff that you're interested in while you're living in sin and uh, not really sensitive to his will, his purpose, and his plan, and not really concerned about doing his will for your life. And a third reason is because we're not ready sometimes. We're not ready to listen to him. We're on our way doing our thing, heading in our direction. And if there's sin in our life, then uh, why would God, why would God answer the petition of our heart? Why would this sovereign God of the universe, watch this now, overlook His demand for holiness, overlook His demand for obedience, overlook His requirement to walk in His way and His will and answer our prayer? Somebody says, well, I pray for things, and sometimes I'm just about to have backslidden, and God answers my prayer. No, He doesn't. The devil can help answer your prayer. Listen, and this is one of his ways of operating. You pray that if it's something that God does not want you to have, I guarantee you, Satan will offer you some alternative, some counterfeit, so anything to get you out of the will and purpose and plan of God. He'll help you. He'll help you in some way, keep you out of the will of God. This is why, listen, this is why when people say, well, I pray and this is what happens in my life. and 
you and I know if God doesn't do something to stop us to get our attention and we sort of manage and we manipulate our circumstances, what do we do? We just keep heading in the same direction. God is silent to get our attention. And God hates sin in our life, doesn't want it in our life. And so sometimes we're not able and not ready to listen. And then sometimes, listen, He's teaching us to trust Him. Now think about this. If I, every time I come to God and ask Him about something, and I have this conversation with Him, and I know that He's speaking to me, after a while, you know, I, I, it's not a matter of trust. But if I come to Him and God doesn't say anything, He's very silent. Can I trust Him with His silence? Can I trust God when He's silent? Or do I have to have something? Do I have to have some, uh, some indication that He's listening? Can I trust Him that when He's silent, He hasn't changed? When He's silent, it doesn't mean that He's inactive. When He's silent, it doesn't mean He's not listening. And when He's silent, it doesn't mean He's not going to grant me my request. God wants us to have a relationship with Him that's, listen, that's based on what? An intimate, listen, an intimacy with Him that's not, as some people say, I will love you if, and none of us want to be loved on some condition. God doesn't want us loving Him just on some condition, but just because He's God. And so silence sometimes is His way of teaching us to trust Him. And then, of course, one of the significant things about His silence is this. Now, listen carefully. Listen and say amen. amen. He wants you and me to learn to distinguish between His voice and other voices. He wants us to learn to distinguish between His voice and other voices. You think about all the voices you hear in a given day. I can remember when I was a kid growing up, when I'd come home from school every afternoon, I had about five buddies, and we'd go down to this big field and play. And uh, uh, I can still remember this, that um, we would play till supper time, as we call it in those days. And... Uh, the reason we knew it was supper time is our mothers would call us. And all of our mothers would call us. They knew where we were. I can hear my mother, Charles. Well, listen, my friend's, mother would, my friend's mother's voice was one voice. My mother's voice was another. All five of our mothers would call us. Even if my mother had never called my name and she'd say, It's time for dinner, time for supper. You know how I would know? I knew my mother's voice. It wouldn't make any difference how many mothers call. I knew Rebecca's voice. She was my mother. I grew up with that voice. I knew that voice. And so I didn't have to wonder. If somebody else had called, it didn't make any difference because I knew my mother's voice. And so we have to learn to distinguish between the voice of God and other voices. Lots of people will give you advice about what you ought to do. And then when you get alone with God in silence and you begin to ask Him, then you're able to distinguish between what He's saying and what other people may be saying. Then I think another wonderful thing about His silence is this, and that is for the simple reason. His goal is intimacy with us. His goal is relationship. His goal is a deep, deep abiding relationship. Now, if you're happily married with somebody, can you not sit or lie with that person, not say anything, not do anything, and be perfectly content. If you have a genuine loving relationship, you don't have to have this, you don't have to have that. There are times when just presence, that's all. Well, can you trust God? Just presence. Just being in His presence. That's, that's, what, that's what He wants. In other words, he, he wants to get us beyond, I need this, I need that, protect me, provide this, and my wife, and my children, and my family, and my car, and my house, and my job. In other words, don't you think God would like to just have you quietly, just like you are? Now, the question is this, and that is, how should you and I respond? So let's think about some ways we should respond. And the first one is this, we should ask Him why. Somebody says, you should never question God. Oh, yes, you can. And let me just say this. When you question God, God does not get upset. He's not going to punish you. Do you which if you need any evidence at all, what about what Jesus said on the cross? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
That gives us the privilege and the pattern. You and I have the right to, to question God about anything. Because remember this, it, do, it doesn't bother Him. It doesn't make God, it doesn't get Him upset, and it doesn't cause Him to feel bad toward us. Remember this, He understands us perfectly. He knows what motivates us to question Him. He knows why. And so, one of the first and right response is that you and I can ask Him why and not expect any punishment. The second one is this, that, as we said, His silence doesn't, doesn't mean that He's inactive. In other words, if you come to Him and ask Him about something and ask Him to show you His will for your life, what usually happens at the end of that period of silence is exactly what you were concerned about, is exactly what He does. But it has to be in His timing, you see, because oftentimes we want things, and usually when do we want them? Now, or either yesterday. Remember what I said, God is not a God on demand. Just as whenever I want Him, He shows up. No, He is a person. He's the infinite personality of everything and all things that are good. He's somebody. He's beyond being human. He is absolutely divine. He can deal with any single one of us or all of us, all of us individually. That's how He operates. You say, how do you explain that? I can't explain that. He's God. If I could explain Him, He wouldn't be God. And so we just know by experience and by His Word how He operates. And so when you think about uh, how you should respond, uh, you should remember that His silence does not mean He's inactive and that He's doing something good in our life. A third thing is this. If you go to the 46th Psalm, for example, and here's a verse that's translated a little different in different uh, passages, but you and I probably know it best by, be still and know that I'm God. And in the American Standard Version, uh, that verse says, cease striving uh, and know that I'm God, which is the same thing. It's just a different way of saying it. Cease striving and know that I'm God. How am I to respond? How am I to respond? I'm to respond not with anger and doubt and fear and frustration and anxiety and all the rest, but I'm to respond by being quiet and trusting Him and knowing that in His silence, He is working something good for my life. And at the proper time, the appropriate time, that whatever, whatever I'm concerned about, He is going to deal with because He promised to do it. He says He will, per watch this, He will perfect what concerns us. God is personally interested in our life, and so we just have to wait and, and bide our time with Him. Well, so I'm to respond by trusting, and then of course I'm to respond by anticipating, listen, anticipating a more intimate relationship with Him. In other words, I should expect that. I anticipate, in other words, if He's silent, God not only wants to do something good in my life, but He wants to draw me into a much more intimate relationship with Him than I've ever had. And our relationship to Jesus Christ should be, and can be, and will be, as intimate and as satisfying as we're willing for Him to work in our life His way and His time. So how should we respond? Anticipating that. Then, of course, think about this. We should re this is how we should respond. Respect the right of God to be silent. In other words, He's not under any obligation to us at all. And so I respect the right of God to be silent when He chooses to be silent. I don't have to know why, really. I will ask Him why. I will look at myself and see if there's something He wants to deal with. But God has the right to be silent. And if you are married or you have a friend and you're on your way somewhere and one of you just doesn't talk, well, is something wrong? No. Well, why aren't you talking? I just want to be quiet. We, that's, it's very, we, don't, we don't live in a quiet society. We live in a noisy world. The television's noisy, the radio's noisy, and the cell phones are noisy. If you think about what people are doing today to, to be so they can't have any silence, iPod in his pocket, cell phone in the ear, radio on. I mean, I mean, just think about it. When are you ever silent? It won't happen automatically. It'll only happen as a deliberate decision on your part to be quiet before God. Well, we should respond in that fashion, recognize that. Then, of course, 
one of the best ways when God is silent is to just get in the Word of God and start reading. Read where? It doesn't make any difference where. Wherever you choose to read. A good place to read, uh, if you're not too familiar with some passages, is to start reading the Psalms. Start with number one. Just start reading the Psalms and just say, God, I don't know what's going on, but uh, I'm available. Watch this. I'm available to listen, Lord. And when, listen, when you begin to read the Word of God, remember this carefully. The Holy Spirit who lives inside of you, who knows exactly what your need is, who knows exactly what's going on in your life. He is on the inside, and here's what happens. While you may not be hearing God say anything, the Holy Spirit is interpreting His Word to your heart. Now I want to tell you just one other thing, and this is a real key. When God is silent to you, Keep talking and keep praying. Keep reading the Word because here's what happens. You break through the silence sometimes when God has a purpose in mind, what He's doing. You break through by continually trusting his, in Him in His silence, continually reading His Word, seeing what, what, how did God work in David's life, and Moses' life, and Daniel's life, and Jesus' life. How did, how did the Father work in all these lives? And I want to say one last thing. You know what he's up to? He's up to a personal, intimate relationship with you that will set your Christian life on a level that's so far, far, far above what people think about as being a Christian. It isn't just going to church, reading the Bible and praying and giving money, or being kind or even witnessing to others. All those things are important. What he's after is that intimacy with you. That genuine love that comes from your life toward Him, that spirit of obedience. You see, intimacy implies what? A sense of oneness. The two of you are one. When you and I are thinking the way God thinks, we're going to know His will. We're thinking the way God thinks, what? We're going to understand His love. And you can just go right down the list of all the things our heart desires. When that intimate relationship is there. When do you start that? You should help your children to start that very early in life. And I think about a person living their entire life and never experiencing an intimate relationship with Him. There's some people that silence frightens them. You know what frightens them? Because if there's no sound, you have to think. And many people do not want to think. And I've had people say to me, well, I don't want to think about that now. Or when are you going to think about it? I'll think about one of these days. In other words, you're going to think about dying one of these days. Well, don't give me that death business. I'm not, you can't scare me. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just telling you what's inevitable. There are people who are scared to death of pure silence. But naturally, you would be that way. And I want to encourage you to make as your goal. Set it as a priority. A fresh, new, intimate relationship with Almighty God through His Son, Jesus Christ. And that's the way it all begins. And you may say, well, I'm not a Christian. How does that work? I'll tell you how it works. Nothing works. Until you ask the Lord Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins and tell Him that you're surrendering your life to Him and you're trusting in His forgiveness based on what He did at the cross of Calvary, you may not understand it all. But you know, He died and paid your sin debt in full, and you're asking Him to forgive you. And the moment you ask Him sincerely, He's going to forgive you and give you wisdom and direction in your life. And here's what happens. Then He begins to open your heart to understand what we are talking about. But if you are a believer, I want to challenge you to do something. I want to challenge you that before the day is over, to get by yourself. And I want to challenge you to humble yourself before Almighty God and get on your knees and acknowledge His Lordship in your life and tell Him that you just want to be quiet. You want to be silent and that He can say anything He wants to. Oh, He didn't have to say anything. But you want to offer yourself to Him in silence that whatever He may choose to say, you want to hear Him carefully. If you will practice 
silence before him. Listen carefully. Watch this. Anxiety, fretting, fuming, worrying, and all the stuff that are giving people heart attacks, strokes, heart trouble, all kind of other things is going to disappear. You know why? Because he's going to place something in you you can't buy. No doctor can give it to you. Nobody else can do it for you. He's going to give you a sense of himself that satisfies this is the deepest longing of your heart. It's yours for the asking. And Father, how grateful we are for your love for us and that you love us enough to want a personal relationship with us which is almost beyond our comprehension because we are so unworthy of that. And yet when you saved us, you gave us a position that we could have that kind of relationship. And that is my prayer for every person who hears this message. Place a hunger in every heart for yourself. Not for what you have to give, but for you, just yourself. And I know that you'll satisfy that hunger. In Jesus' name, amen. For more information about In Touch Ministries or to learn how you can have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, call our telephone number or write to us at the address on your screen. In Touch with Dr. Charles Stanley is made possible by the grace of God and the faithfulness of our ministry partners around the world. Hey, it's only one drink. How am I ever going to pay all these bills? Who's going to find out if I just take a quick peek? My mother is so sick, Lord. How can I help her? Life is full of challenges. Let the Bible teaching of Dr. Charles Stanley help you live life at its best. Watch In Touch with Dr. Charles Stanley every week right here on this station. You can drift through life and miss the best. The Word of God is our instruction book. It's our guidebook. It's our compass. It should be the rudder of our life. Learn how to navigate through life using the Word of God as your guide. Watch In Touch with Dr. Charles Stanley every week right here on this station.